This is a true story based on air traffic control recordings, official reports and interviews with those involved. Tuesday, August the 2nd, 2005, Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. 297 passengers are boarding Air France Flight 358, bound for Toronto. Uh, far aisle, left hand side. Yes. Philippe Lacaille is traveling with his wife and two of his four children. They're stuck at the back of the enormous jet, and they're not sitting together. It just happened that we were separated uh, from Emily. They had three seats together, so we were in the middle section, and Emily was actually sitting a couple of seats ahead of us on the right side, so close to the right wing of the plane. For Eddie Ho, Flight 358 is the continuation of a trip that began in Johannesburg. I'm an international student in Canada at Queen's University, and every summer I go back to South Africa. Ho isn't traveling light. I was carrying um, everything that I had, my books to my clothing, to tuition money for the year, computer laptops. This is also another leg in a long journey for Joanne Cordery Bundock, who's returning from a trip to Thailand. I rerouted myself in the last uh, two days before the flight from Bangkok through Paris to come directly to Toronto. As the passengers continue to board, the flight crew gets settled into the Airbus A340. The captain is 57-year-old Alain Rosai. He's been with Air France for more than 20 years. His co-pilot is 43-year-old Frédéric No. Do you want to start or should I? Uh, why don't you fly first and then I'll take over for landing in Toronto? I check the weather. On this flight, the two men decide that Captain Rosai will handle the takeoff in Paris and co pilot No will land in Toronto. Destination Toronto Pearson. Check. Crews often split the duties so that co pilots can get more experience. Rizai and No are joined by one other person in the cockpit. I think you've been expecting me. I'm Miles Trochasse. Miles Trochasse is the son of an Air France employee. He's allowed to ride in the cockpit's jump seat for free. I just want to let you know I've done this before. I promise I'll be quiet. This Air France plane is one of the safest in the world. Since the A340s first went into service in 1993, they've had an excellent safety record. Air France 358. Air France 358, runway 27 left. Cleared for takeoff. Cleared for takeoff. Air France 358. Have a good afternoon, gentlemen. Just a few minutes before two in the afternoon, flight 358 powers into the sky above Paris. Toronto may be several thousand kilometers away, but the friends and family of those on board Flight 358 are already making plans to meet the plane when it arrives. Huh? Audrey, I won't forget. I'll make sure to pick up mom and dad. No, I won't forget the two brats either. I'll get them all. Well, we usually make arrangements before we go to France to be picked up. It's easier because we have lots of luggage, you know, and we bring back stuff from France. So uh, it just happened that Julian, our son, was going to spend the, the summer in, uh, in Toronto and was available to pick us up. Sis, I'll give you a call as soon as we get in. Don't worry. I got it covered. OK? All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Center. We have a humid X advisory and extreme heat alert for Toronto as well as a thunderstorm warning in effect for Toronto. A regular flight from Paris to Toronto takes about eight hours. As Air France 358 closes in on Canada, there's little to separate this trip from any other. I found that their service was amazing. The food was great. They had 
very good uh, flat attendance. There were a lot of exchange students from France, you know, like teenagers, you know, coming to Canada for their first time, usually uh, their first flight, and uh, they were very rowdy. There was a beautiful day on the flight over, and the sun was shining, and it was just blue skies and white clouds, and just a lovely day. The autopilot does most of the work for Captain Alain Rezai and his co-pilot, Frédéric No. Just as the two men had planned, No is now in control of the plane. We have a new weather report. The two men get regular updates on the weather conditions in Toronto. Overcast and rainy with a chance of thunderstorms, temperature in the low 20s. At Toronto's International Airport, the thunderstorms are already rolling through. Rain, wind and lightning are hammering the runways. The lightning has already forced airport authorities to declare a red alert. It means that the chance of being struck by lightning is so great that ground crews are not allowed to work on the planes. Just as Flight 358 closes in on Toronto, it's put into a holding pattern. The weather isn't Air getting France any better. There's going to be a little delay. Uh, Air France 358, so Roger on delay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. I'm sorry to inform you that there'll be a short delay. There's some weather conditions above Toronto, and we're just going to give it a couple of minutes to clear up. I was very surprised when I heard the captain's announcement that we were going to be delayed in landing for about 25 or 30 minutes because of thunderstorms over Toronto. While they're not in the storm yet, the crew enters their holding pattern northeast of Toronto. Their alternate airport is almost 300 kilometers away in Ottawa. At the moment, the plane has a little over 7,500 kilograms of fuel in its tanks, more than enough to get them there. Typically, a pilot will think about the economic impact of diverting to an alternate airport. While that is not a primary decision maker, it is an alternate decision maker as far as if they have to divert, how are the folks going to be transported from that alternate airport back to the destination airport uh, that the airplane was originally going to? Flying almost 300 passengers to Ottawa would be a logistical nightmare. But the crew can't circle for too long with the fuel they have. If the delay continues, they'll have no choice but to divert. Air France, Toronto arrival. Your hold is now cancelled. You are cleared for a WASI 2 arrival. Maintain 5,000 feet. Air France, 358, roger on cancellation of hold. Cleared for Wasi to arrival and maintain... Today, the delay isn't long at all. Although the storm continues to thunder down near the airport, the crew is put into their landing sequence. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Just wanted to let you know we're beginning our descent into Toronto at this time. We should be on the ground at about 4 p.m. local time. Usually when they say 45 minutes, you know, it's to be nice. You know, usually it's like an hour, an hour and a half. This time it was like 20 minutes. 20 minutes later, they said, okay, well, now we're gonna go down, prepare, you know, for, for the landing. With co-pilot Frederic No at the controls, the plane begins its descent into the storm. Air France 358, reducing speed to 190. No isn't prepared for what he's about to face. The storm has a savage surprise in store for everyone on board flight 358. A brutal summer storm is battering Toronto. Winds and lightning are hammering the airport, making it tense for incoming planes. After a short hold, Air France Flight 358, with 297 passengers aboard, begins descending into the storm. Flaps two, 
F speed. Gear down. Landing gear down. Spoilers armed. Four green. Landing gear down. Spoilers armed. Four green. It'll be fine. Don't worry. It immediately turned into very dark skies and dark clouds and a little bit bumpy and choppy and the weather outside was definitely within a thunderstorm. But really and truly, to me, it was just a typical uh, stormy landing. Nothing out of the ordinary. In the main cabin, though, not everyone is so sure. The plane was getting very bumpy. Uh, there was a lot of turbulence. We were surrounded, basically, by heavier rain, and this was completely not expected. I didn't expect that. Air France 358, slow your final approach speed. Air France 358. Co-pilot Frederic No has the plane in position. He's moments from landing. Air France 358, Roger. Flaps to full. Flaps full. darker and darker. We were like in the middle of hundreds and hundreds of lightnings. Like every second we had lightnings all around us. So people were getting uh, nervous, uh, quite nervous. I was getting nervous. Ahead of the Air France Airbus, two other planes have just touched down on the same runway that Flight 358 is heading for. Air France 358, this is Toronto Tower. Toronto Tower, Air France 358, go ahead. You are cleared to land runway 24 left. Be advised the preceding aircraft reports breaking action is poor, and they estimate the surface winds near the runway as 290 degrees at 15 to 20 knots. Breaking poor, 15 knots, gust to 20. Uh, France 358, thank you. The crew is being sent to runway 24 left, which will allow them to land into the wind. It also happens to be the closest runway to the city's biggest freeway which is gearing up to handle the evening rush hour traffic. Facing unpredictable winds and a wet runway, the crew prepare for the landing. Select auto brakes to medium. Medium is set. The final approach for landing was um, was hellish. Lightnings were all over. Uh, turbulences were enormous. Uh, you could feel the pilot fight with the plane to keep the, the, the plane in line with the runway to land. And they had a heck of a time to keep it uh, lined up. I know my son next to me was getting very nervous. And I was nervous to see my daughter actually uh, far from us. I cinched up my seatbelt tighter than it was, uh, expecting a very hard landing and the pilot was gonna stick it on the uh, runway, or we were maybe gonna do a touch and go and he was gonna give it power and go around because I knew that it was not going to be a, just a normal landing. Landing, autopilot, auto thrust off. At two minutes after four o'clock, Air France Flight 358 roars over the beginning of the runway. more intense and harder than any time I've ever landed in another aircraft. 
It's a very difficult landing. And everyone started clapping. And even the lady who was sitting next to me, I remember very clearly, she said, you know, wow, that was an amazing landing. And as soon as she finished that sentence, then all hell broke loose. We started just, the, the, the plane started violently going up and down. And it felt like we were going 100 miles an hour down a road filled with potholes that were about three feet deep. Immediately, you could see this orange aura. And for me, uh, it's a picture I will never forget. My daughter was sitting on ahead of us on the right side of the plane. And at that time, she turned her, her head towards us, you know, with very wide eyes, you know, looking at us. And her face was surrounded by this enormous aura, orange aura of fire. Then, moments after touching down, still traveling at 146 kilometers per hour, flight 358 runs out of room. At that point, that uh, I believed that we were all going to die. It was obvious that uh, look, no one can survive this kind of thing. I thought this was it. The next thing that I can remember is that a, an announcement came. Ladies and gentlemen, everything's okay. We've stopped now. <gasps> well, no kidding. Of course we've stopped now. But I could tell that everything was not okay because I could immediately smell jet fuel. As the smell of jet fuel fills the cabin. Fire! Panic quickly spreads. Everybody was expecting the plane to, to blow up. It was obvious. Smoke and flames are spreading quickly. Now it's a desperate struggle to escape. Uh, you hear shouting from the back that there was a fire and fire, and then people started really get panicked. If they don't get out, they have just seconds to live. We know that about two minutes into a fire, in many cases, the environment becomes untenable. So 90 seconds is a good rule that we use in trying to get people out to make sure that they have as much time and safety as possible. 297 passengers are desperate to leave the plane. Emily! 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 The only thing that matters to me now is to get my daughter Emily, who's sitting like two seats ahead of me, get her, get her onto me, and protect her as we blow up. Am I going to try to get my luggage, my laptop? And then I thought to myself, what if I would die trying to get my laptop? I just said, OK, I've got to get out. I've got to get out. Flight 358 has eight possible emergency exits. But seconds after the crash, most of them aren't opened. People were crawling over the seats. They were pushing each other. They were just basically all for yourself. Stay calm, please. Please stay calm. Be all right. Open the door. Open the door. And I could see the uh, air attendant there struggling with the fact that should I or should I not open this door? Because the fire was raging just in front of it. If the fuel tanks rupture and we have a lot of fuel that gets out either onto the ground, well then there's enough heat and fire there that would uh, cause the airplane skin to melt in a couple minutes. At the front of the plane, thick smoke is pouring in through one of the open doors. 
Joanne Cordery Bundock races to the other side of the plane. The gentleman in front of me had his bag with him, and he was kind of fumbling around with that and trying to take that down the slide. He was a rather large man, and the slide did not deploy the entire way, so I kind of bailed off the side above him and hit the ground. Eddie Ho has found an exit too, but there's no slide. And people pushing me forward, I, I couldn't even control myself. Um, and I was like, you know, I don't want to jump as well because, you know, it was five meters down at least. Is he okay? Is he okay? In the cockpit, Captain Rosai has been badly injured when his seat was ripped off the floor by the force of the crash. As precious seconds tick by, the flight attendant near the Lakais manages to open the exit door. Even though passengers are confronted with the flames and smoke of the burning engine, they jump out of the plane. So push them down, my wife went down, I went down. We, uh, we just ran up as fast as we could uh, through uh, torn metal and thorns and like through whatever was left of the ground where the plane was. Once the fire gets inside the airplane, all of the furnishings are much like the furnishings in your house and there are foams and materials that when they catch on fire produce toxic gases and that's really the, uh, the most important uh, lethal aspect of the fire. Basically, you just had to jump. So what I did was, you know, I prayed quickly and I closed my eyes and, and jumped. Emergency workers are able to reach the burning jet just 52 seconds after it crashes. But with the threat of an explosion, it's dangerous to get too close. It was very difficult to see anything due to the rain that was coming down. There was a lot of smoke uh, engulfing the plane, some fire that was still ongoing, um, as well as you could see that some of the parts of the plane had uh, broken off, some of the wheels that were at the side of the roadway, as well as portions of the plane's wings that had broken off. Philippe Lacay and his family struggle up the hill the plane has just plowed down. You know, uh, and at that point, the, um, the plane blew up. Once, twice, three times. So you could feel and hear the, the, this enormous explosion actually uh, taking place. Um, on the first one, I, I looked at the first one because I just couldn't believe my eyes. You know, I could see, I think, pieces of luggage, things flying up in the air. You know. And of course, at that time, I figured, oh my God, you know, that could have been us, you know. We had a perfect view of the airplane and see this black smoke coming out the side of the airplane and the yellow and the orange and the red flames shooting out. We were fine, but we just knew that there were so many passengers in that plane that had not gotten out. August the 2nd, 2005. Air France Flight 358 has crashed off its runway in Toronto. Flames are tearing at the fuselage. Smoke is pouring from the ruined jet. Dazed passengers are stumbling from the plane. Passengers that were coming up, uh, again, were very uh, rain-soaked and muddy from coming up the hill. There were several individuals that once they got up there were crying and a bit emotional, uh, as well as looking around for other passengers or, or family or friends that may have been with them at the time. About 35 minutes ago, a plane ran off the uh, runway at Toronto's Pearson Airport. Footage of the crash quickly appears on local TV stations. Philippe Lacay's daughter Audrey is one of the many people shocked by the pictures. She turned on uh, her TV. And here we go. There was the Air France crash right here, live in front of her. 
you know, burning, exploding right in front of our eyes. 250 people on board. We have not had any reason uh, to uh, make a statement yet as to whether anybody has survived or escaped. Philippe Lacaille's son Julien is waiting for his father at the airport. He has no idea what's just happened to the Air France flight. What? What do you mean, where am I? I'm at the airport waiting for mom and dad. Like, you, what? So Julien didn't know anything, and he was there at the airport. And she says, well, you know what? I think you're going to have to wait a long time because the airplane just crashed. One of the busiest highways in North America borders the airport. Just before rush hour, it's packed with thousands of vehicles. Drivers slow down, captivated by the terrifying sight of the burning plane. Some of the passengers who've escaped the plane stumble, dazed and shaken, right onto the edge of the highway. Passing motorists stop to take them to the airport. At this point, there was only about 25 or 30 people with me in the airport. And, and here, you're, you're also beginning to think, is this all there is? As people are brought in, airport employees struggle to account for all the passengers and crew. They were totally disorganized. There's no announcements being made. There's nothing of any kind of organization. And you're in this little crowded area with all the irate passengers waiting to be processed some people even said, you know, the first disaster was the plane crash. And the second disaster is exactly how it was handled afterwards. Relatives wait desperately for any news. Julien Lacaille is just one of many who fears the worst. For at least an hour and a half, he thought we were dead. That's a shame because, uh, of course, we, uh, we panicked, we, we were scared to death, but the families that were waiting for the passengers, they were even more scared because it lasted much longer. They, they really believed deep down that their family members were dead. Finally, hours after the crash, passengers who have waiting family members are reunited. Julian. Julian! Oh. We finally met up with Julian. It was 11 o'clock at night. It was, uh, you know, God, we're so lucky. We're so lucky. We're alive, you know? Uh, it's hard to explain, but it's like um, you're giving a second chance, you know? Here's my son, you know. Maybe I didn't tell him I loved him, you know, when I left for France. Now it's time to, to, to say it right away. It was, uh, it was a very nice moment. A very, very deep moment. It's just one of dozens of reunions. It takes hours to confirm, but by early evening, Air France and the local airport authorities can make the incredible announcement. Remarkably, every single passenger and all the members of the crew of Flight 358 have managed to escape the burning wreckage of their plane. The next day, smoke and charred wreckage are all that remain of Air France Flight 358. The Airbus A340 is a sophisticated, highly engineered plane with a glowing safety record. What had gone so terribly wrong? Canada's Transportation Safety Board quickly begins investigating the accident. Landing, autopilot, auto thrust off. Rain and lightning had been battling the airport all afternoon. Was it simply bad weather that caused this crash? Put it down. 
Put it down! Neither the pilot nor the co-pilot have spoken publicly about the crash. We have to evacuate now! Citing lawsuits that were filed soon after, Air France has kept all of its employees who were on the plane from speaking to the media. Is he OK? I don't know. Is he OK? I don't know. But former Air France trainer Hervé Labart has spoken to Captain Rosai. We spoke, let me think, for half an hour. He told me that this is the crucial point, that he has control. More specifically, he informed control that he had reached the point where he would have to consider diverting. What he told me is that control informed him that they would soon open the runway. There was, of course, a lot of lightning, rain and turbulence. And turbulence can have a devastating effect. Instruments become more difficult to read. The aircraft is harder to handle. On lit moins bien les instruments. L'avion est plus difficile parce qu'il bouge beaucoup, quoi. Investigators discover that as the crew struggled for control in the cockpit, on the ground, delicate instruments used to measure the wind at the runway were destroyed by lightning. With the ground equipment destroyed, they were relying on their onboard systems for information about wind conditions. The onboard equipment only gives them the actual wind direction and speed on the nose of the aircraft at that exact time. It does not predict ahead of the aircraft. So the pilots really have no way of knowing what lies ahead of them. But two planes had touched down just minutes before the Air France flight on the same runway. The crews of those planes did their best to inform air traffic control of the tricky conditions. Air France 358. Toronto Tower. Toronto Tower, Air France 358, go ahead. You are cleared to land runway 24 left. Be advised, proceeding aircraft reports braking action is poor, and they estimate the surface winds near the runway as 290 degrees at 15 to 20 knots. Braking poor, 15 knots. 20 knot winds are strong, but are well within the allowable range for landing an A340. But when investigators study radar images of the airport, they discover quite a different story. As Flight 358 landed, a sharp line of rain moved across the runway from north to south. It was driven by a sudden gust of wind of up to 33 knots. The crew of the Air France jet had to deal with conditions that were much worse than they were expecting. Landing, autopilot, auto thrust off. 33 knots is the demonstrated maximum crosswind for an A340 and that would be on a dry runway. So when you say 33 knots at 90 degrees, you're, you're encroaching on the limits of the aircraft. Closely studying the airport, investigators uncover another piece of the puzzle. Maintenance issues and the storm itself were forcing air traffic controllers to use runway 24 left for landings. It's the shortest runway at the airport almost 650 meters shorter than some of the others. Blinded by rain, driven by unexpected winds, and landing on the shortest runway at the airport, Flight 358 was in a dangerous position. Over the previous four hours, they had been made aware of the terrible storms and red alerts. And that was for me my biggest concern. Were they perhaps overtired? Were they lax, victims of routine? In any case, it's obvious that they hadn't gauged the extent of the danger. It's evident that the flight crew didn't perceive the information that they were getting from these various sources as being threatening. Therefore, they attempted to make a landing. But even in bad conditions, even on a short runway, the crew had 3,000 meters in which to land their plane. It should have been enough. To find out why it wasn't, investigators turned to the past. In 1999, an eerily similar accident took place in Little Rock, Arkansas. Damn, we're off course. Oh, I can't see it. Way off. Struggling with unpredictable weather, the crew of an American Airlines jet landed their plane, only to have it skid off the runway. Eleven people were killed. Greg Fife helped investigate that crash. One of the first things that I thought about was deja vu. Having the first bits of information about the Air France accident, it reminded me so much of the American Airlines accident. 
In the Little Rock crash, Fife discovered that the crew had made a critical mistake which contributed significantly to the accident. They hadn't followed all of the checklist procedures and they didn't have the ground spoilers armed, which basically degrades the efficiency of lift on the wing and settles the airplane heavily on the main wheel so that braking action is more effective. Spoilers are only one of several ways pilots of passenger jets stop their massive planes. Reverse thrusters are used to redirect the engine power forward as the plane lands. And sophisticated brakes help slow the jets down. To rule out any mechanical fault, all three systems are examined by investigators of the Air France crash. One of the brakes on Flight 358 was destroyed in the fire, but the seven other sets of brakes are all tested after the accident. All of them are working properly. Flaps two, flaps two, F speed. Investigators in Toronto also discover that unlike in the Little Rock crash, this time the spoilers had deployed properly. The gear down, spoilers armed, four green. And when the engines are examined, the reverse thrusters are deployed. No obvious mechanical fault can be found. As the investigation continues, a French newspaper prints a bombshell. Le Figaro publishes a story claiming that the thrust reversers, which use the jet's engines to slow it down, were not turned on until the plane had been on the runway for more than 12 seconds. As, propos, le, le commandant Rosé, As for Captain Rosé, he confirmed the newspaper report. His explanation was that his co-pilot had tense stopped and was having difficulty controlling the lateral movement of the plane. No doubt because of the strong cross winds and because the runway was so slippery, his hand was clamped tightly on the throttle release lever, which prevented the captain from reaching it himself. So the reverse thrusters could not be activated. Shortly after the newspaper story appears, investigators publish their initial report. It confirms Le Figaro's version of events. Canada's Transportation Safety Board reveals that while the thrusters were found in the on position at the crash site, they had not been deployed as soon as the plane landed. In fact, it took 17 seconds before they reached maximum power. The delay was a question raised in the, in the report, and I wouldn't want to hazard a guess as to why there was such a delay or what was the cause of it. I just know that uh, pilots, as a rule, want to get those reversers in as quickly as possible for maximum stopping. The investigators reveal other confusing facts about the last few seconds of Flight 358. When it came over the start of the runway, it was twice as high as it should have been. And when it did land, it was nearly halfway down the runway. Put it down! Put, put it down! In these stormy conditions, the crew didn't have enough time to stop. Once they found that the airplane had floated down the runway, the pilot has to make the decision whether we stay on the ground and try to salvage this bad situation, or we abort the landing, power up, pull up, and go around, get our stuff together, and then come back for a second landing. Air France 358. But decisions in a cockpit are joint decisions. The captain and the first officer work together. Si le commandant. If the captain sees that landing will be difficult, he must open throttle and go through abort landing procedures. That's his duty. It's an obligation. And of course, the co-pilot is also allowed to be the first to act. But the captain's duty is to avoid at all costs a lengthy touchdown. That is clear. By the time the plane touched down, it had only 1,500 meters to stop. And when it did land, critical seconds were lost when the reverse thrusters weren't engaged. Would it have made a difference to immediately activate the reverse thrusters? Of course it would. Since reverse function reaches its peak efficiency at high speed, that is the exact moment of touchdown, that's what reverse is there for. It's all a matter of aerodynamic braking. 
The other problem is that the wheels touched ground in the middle of the runway. And reverse or no reverse, at that point it was already too late, as was pointed out by the head of the inquiry. That being said, if the reverse thrusters had been activated immediately, the plane would have come to a stop more quickly. In heavy storms, the margin for error is razor thin. On this rain-filled afternoon, sudden wind, a long landing and a short runway sealed the fate of everyone on board Flight 358. What concerns some in the aviation industry isn't this particular flight, but the reality that overruns are far too common. They happen all around the world. And safety procedures that could stop them are not in place. In August 2005, Air France Flight 358 crashed off the end of a runway in Toronto. It was a horrifying incident, yet amazingly, everyone survived. But Flight 358 wasn't the only jet to go off the end of a runway in 2005. Worldwide, there were 37 other runway overruns. And the causes of all these accidents were remarkably similar. There are a number of causal factors that occur again and again in runway overrun accidents. The weather conditions, the state of the runway surface. It can be wet, it can be icy, it can have snow on it. Speed in excess of a normal approach speed for the aircraft that does not then bleed off as the aircraft attempts to land. And these factors occur again and again in runway overrun accidents. Unlike the crash at Toronto, some overruns are deadly. This Southwest Airlines flight in Chicago slid off its runway several months after the Air France crash. A small child was killed in a car that was driving on the nearby highway. Many older airports, in particular in big cities which have expanded out towards the airport in the course of their growth, are constrained in the area that they can use for overruns. You have to consider what happens when the runway is contaminated? Snow, ice, standing water. That will degrade the stopping performance of the airplane. Add to that a tailwind component, which was existent at the time that Air France landed. That, in combination with the contaminated runway, can jeopardize the landing performance and, in fact, increase it probably by 50%. The International Civil Aviation Organization recommends that every airport have a 300-meter safety zone at the end of runways that handle international flights. Canadian standards are a little less strict. They call for a 60-meter overrun area and recommend another 90 meters on top of that. Runway 24 left meets the low end of those recommendations. There was another runway overrun accident to the runway in Toronto, which was very closely aligned with the runway that is there at the moment, in 1978, when a DC-9, an Air Canada DC-9, rejected a takeoff and ran into the ravine. Well, the plane started to break, and then there was just nothing, and then we dropped over the edge. It was about a 50-foot drop, I guess, at the end of the runway. We just went over the top, and then there was a heck of a bang, and people and seats all over the place. Two people died in the 1978 accident. A coroner's inquest after the crash recommended that the gully be filled in, but it never was. It's a steep ravine. It has about a 50-foot drop-off, and when you take a large, complicated and fragile piece of machinery, like a commercial aircraft, and you drop it 50 feet, then it tends to break. There is a possible solution to runway overruns but it's not being used in Toronto or many other international airports. It's called EMAS, or Engineered Material Arresting Systems. It's a form of artificial stone or artificial gravel, which has a certain depth. And anybody who's ridden a bicycle into a gravel pit knows that a bicycle stops very quickly and it can be almost impossible to pedal it out. And the same thing happens to airplanes. Several airports in the US use the system, but most international airports do not. It's very much more effective than friction braking, and it's certainly incomparably more effective 
than thrust reverse and spoilers. And any one of these systems, when properly engineered, can stop a large airplane, no matter what the runway surface conditions, in a very short distance. We have to evacuate now! But one vital air safety guideline was met when Flight 358 crashed. In spite of the smoke and the spreading fire, the crew of the crippled plane made sure that all the passengers escaped in just 90 seconds. It's just a miracle that all of those people were able to evacuate the airplane as quickly as they did before the airplane was consumed. The Air France flight was particularly noteworthy in that everybody got out uh, essentially unscathed. I know there were some injuries, but, but everyone got out. So uh, I think it was uh, noteworthy, and it was a very good evacuation from that perspective. Captain Alain Rosai may never fly for Air France again. His injuries required extensive physical therapy after the crash. At the time, he was less than three years from retirement. Every morning, Captain Rosé relives the experience, coming face to face with the flames, the noise, the crash. And it made him sad to end his career on that note, having destroyed his plane. That's the worst possible fate for a pilot, the worst outcome. The co-pilot, Frédéric No, is suspended for three months after the accident. By early the next year, he's back on duty with Air France. There are reports that after he helped Captain Rosai out of the cockpit, he was the last person off the plane. The passengers deal with the crash in their own ways. Well, I went through uh, nightmares almost every single night, uh, flashbacks during the day. I um, couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. You know, I questioned myself, why am I here? It's frightening you know, to, to be in such a state. And it has taught me to be strong. We really need to take seriously uh, those safety commands and evacuation information because you never know. It was a perfect flight, there's not any indications that anything can go wrong and it's right at the ver very last second that everything happens um, so it's it, thank goodness I'm here to be able to talk about it now Open the door. Open the door. <laughs> there's a lot of negative in the accident and there's a lot of positive the negative is, oh my God, you know, I'm gonna die. Oh my God, it's horrible. Oh, I have these nightmares. And you know, yes, I'm traumatized. And oh, my kids are traumatized. However, uh, you have the positives. And the positives are, gee, I'm alive. You know, I have been given a second chance. I have been given a second life. And all of us, my wife and my children and myself, we all, um, experience the same positive effects of the crash, which is we have to give back. We have to do something for others. We have to extend our heart out, our compassion to people who, who need it. It's almost therapeutic for us, you know. The more you do for others, the better you're gonna feel. So for me, I figured, you know, if I can extend my heart out to others, maybe it's gonna help me as well. Nimitz Hill, Guam. Once the site of fierce American offensives during World War II, for over 50 years, there's been peace here. Now the hill is peaceful, invaded by hunters. And the normal quiet is broken by the roar of jumbo jets as they fly overhead. Every night, commercial pilots must fly over this tall, rocky outcrop and land at Guam's Aganya International Airport. Flights come from airports all across Asia. 
Just past midnight on August the 6th, 1997, Korean Airlines Flight 801 is on its way to Guam from Seoul, South Korea. 42-year-old Captain Park Yung Chol is at the controls. A former Korean Air Force pilot, Park has been flying 747s for more than six years. Just a few months ago, he received a flight safety award from the president of Korean Air for successfully handling a 747 engine failure at low altitude. Park is supposed to be flying to the United Arab Emirates tonight, but a scheduling change has put him in command of this shorter flight to Guam. In the cabin, Korean, Japanese and Western tourists are heading for Guam's pristine beaches. Guam is a U.S. territory run under U.S. law. The island is tiny, fewer than 600 square kilometers. But there's enough sand to keep people coming. Twenty-four-year-old Sean Burke and his girlfriend, Wendy Bunton, are planning to make the most of Guam's beaches. They're flying in from San Diego for a vacation. Sean and Wendy were uh, going to Guam to do some scuba diving, reef diving, and, um, and at the same time, they were going to visit her brother, who was in the Navy over there. He was a Navy doctor. Flight 801 is taking Barry Small back to work. He's returning to Guam from New Zealand for another six-month contract as a helicopter pilot. But he does it with a heavy heart. The night before I left, uh, my father had a heart attack. And I had to CPR him until the ambulance arrived and decided to cancel the contract so I could uh, help him. But he was insistent that you must carry on with your job. The flight is still a couple of hours from Guam when the calm evening is brutally interrupted. Watch the speed. It could be severe turbulence. Make an announcement to have everyone in their seats with seatbelts on. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your first officer speaking. Even an experienced flyer like Barry Small is surprised. There was no lead up to this turbulence again. Anybody that wasn't strapped down was going to be even, that's for sure. The lockers were rattling and uh, anything uh, in those lockers was, was bound to break. It was uh, a horrendous shudder. It's heavy turbulence but the crew ride it out. Eventually, the flight returns to normal. We're through it. Let the passengers know. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your first officer speaking. We have cleared the turbulent area. But it's left some of the passengers shaken. It's okay, Rika. We'll be there soon. Ma'am, if you don't mind, I'm gonna move this duty-free up here for you. The cabin crew cleans up. And the passengers settle in for the rest of the trip. Because of the 12-hour stopover in, in Seoul and no change of clothes, um, it was getting rather uncomfortable in a tropical environment and I took my shoes off just to, to relax a little bit and feel more comfortable. Captain Park and his crew begin looking ahead. They know there's more unsettled weather coming. Rain has been hitting Guam on and off all day. In fact, August is the heart of the island's rainy season. Small showers can pop up, making visibility unpredictable. 
in that particular part of the world, they have what's called a top hat thunderstorm. That is a very small thunderstorm that builds up all times of the day, and it's very short live. So it wouldn't hamper the pilot's ability to actually conduct the approach. It's gonna just obscure his view for some period of time while they're transiting through it. Just past one in the morning, Korean Air Flight 801 makes initial radio contact with Kurt Mayo, the radar controller at Guam's airport. Guam Center, Korea 801, leaving level 410 for 2,600. Korean Air 801, roger. The crew aren't the only ones preparing to land. After more than three hours of flying through the night, the passengers get ready for the airport. I saw the, the lights of Guam and I knew exactly where the aircraft was because I've been there many times before. Captain Park has navigated Nimitz Hill nine times before, but this time there's a major difference. At airports around the world, pilots land with the help of a glide slope, an electronic system that helps planes safely touch down. If pilots follow the directions given by the glide slope, it guides them to the foot of the runway. The glide slope beacon at Guam Airport has been removed for extensive maintenance. Without the airport transmitter, Park's glide slope indicator in the cockpit is useless. Landing without a glide slope is rare, but it does happen. In Guam, the transmitter is scheduled to be out of service for more than two months. But impaired navigation is only part of the problem. Captain Park is fighting exhaustion. They make us classicize work to the maximum. Probably this way, hotel expenses are saved on cabin crews and they maximize flight hours. Really sleepy. Now, as the plane approaches Guam, clouds and rain block their way. Captain, Guam condition is no good. It's raining a lot. It's been several hours since Captain Park and his crew left Seoul. Now the rain is making the late flight more difficult. Tired and fighting the weather, the captain begins the final approach to the airport. August the 6th, 1997. It's close to 1.30 in the morning. On Korean Airlines Flight 801, a tired captain is preparing to land at Aganya Airport on the island of Guam. In the cabin, 237 passengers are getting ready to begin their holidays or get back to work. The flight, other than the turbulence, was um, totally normal. We had our meals and it was just a totally normal flight in every way. As the jet approaches Guam, an erratic storm pushes rain and clouds between the plane and the airport. It's hard to see. The captain wants to make a small change in course to avoid the worst of the weather. Request 20 mile deviation to the left as we are descending. Bomb center, Korea, 801. Request deviation 10 miles left of track. Korean Air 801, roger. Veering around cloud cover, Captain Park Yung Chol struggles to get a clear view of his approach. And finally, he sees what he's been looking for. It's Guam. Guam. Good. Today, the weather radar helps us a lot. Korean Air 801 cleared for ILS runway 6, left approach. Glide slope unusable. Air traffic controller Kurt Mayo reminds the crew that the airport's glide slope equipment is out of service. It would normally help them find the runway. But since it's under repair, it isn't sending out any signals. Then, with the crew in the middle of their landing sequence, something unexpected happens. The glide slope appears to come to life. Is the glide slope working? The glide slope, yeah? Yes. Yes, it's working. Why is it working? It's a confusing moment. Unsure what's happening, the crew continue to prepare for their landing. 60 check, gear down, check. 
approaching 1,400. Since today's glide slope condition is not good, we need to maintain 1,440. Please set it. Set. At 40 minutes after one in the morning, Guam controller Kurt Mayo once again makes contact with the crew. Korean Air 801, contact the Ganya Tower 118.1. He passes the plane on to the airport tower and says goodbye in Korean. It's the last time he'll ever talk to the crew of the jetliner. The guy working here probably was a GI in Korea before. Aganya Tower, Korean Air 801 to intercept the localizer, six left. Korean Air 801 Heavy, Aganya Tower, runway six, clear to land. Korean 801, Roger, clear to land, six left. Flap 30. Flaps 30. As the plane descends, clouds and rain close in again. They've lost sight of the airport. Look carefully. Ladies and gentlemen, we're preparing for landing at Aganya International Airport in Wang. Please return your seats to the upright position, fasten your seatbelt, and prepare for landing. As the plane flies closer to the ground, the crew expects they'll see the airport any second, but the rain makes it hard to see anything. Isn't the glide slope working? Wiper on. Then a computerized voice fills the cockpit. It's the ground proximity warning system, which tells the crew they're just 500 feet in the air. But they still can't see the runway. I've done this flight many, many times before. And when I estimated we're about 30 seconds from landing, I bent down to put my shoes on. The plane is now just 200 feet above the ground, but still the crew can't see the runway. They're quickly running out of time. Let's make a missed approach. Not inside. Not inside. Missed approach. Go around. Go around. Perhaps. I had no doubts this was still just a normal landing and the aircraft went on and, and was decelerating quicker than normal, but, but nothing to really alarm me. Things were getting pretty serious then. The aircraft was starting to break apart. So I forced myself up to look, and there was just bottles, bags, everything you can imagine was coming out. The only way I can really describe it is like about a, a thousand 737s landing all at once. On a wooded hillside in Guam, the shattered plane finally grinds to a halt. I was too scared to undo my seatbelt at that stage because I was waiting for the next bounce to go over an extra, another ravine or whatever was going to happen next.
Miraculously, 11-year-old Rika Matsuda has survived and is virtually unhurt. But her mother is trapped and injured. Barry Small is also injured and terrified that fire is sweeping through the plane. The fire started in the front and proceeded to, from the front to the back towards me. There was no floor lighting or anything like that, but the fire was so intense, there was no problems to see where I was going. If help doesn't arrive soon, those who survived the initial crash may be trapped inside the cabin. Korean Air 801 Heavy Tower, how do you hear? Everyone in the cockpit has been killed. But airport authorities still have no idea what's happened aboard Flight 801. Hurt by the crash and desperate to escape the ruined plane, Barry Small stumbles towards an opening in the cabin. I got back these, these six, six, six seats and then there was about a six foot drop down to the ground. The undercarriage had gone completely. I came across an obstacle that I had to, to cross because it was the only part that wasn't burning. Here, go! Rika's mother tells her daughter to get out of the burning plane. Go. Go. Go, go now, get out of here. Go. Now go, go. You must go. Go. You must go, go now. The fire is spreading quickly. As passengers struggle to deal with the disaster, rescue workers don't even know the plane's gone down. engulfed both the Asian gentleman and myself to the extent that it burnt my arms and my watch got that hot it was mounting into my skin, into my flesh and I had to flick it off. Minutes earlier Kurt Mayo had passed the passenger jet onto the local tower controllers. Now he learns it hasn't landed yet. Approach Agania, did Korean Air come back to you? No. He didn't land? Negative. Oh my god. Within minutes, Guam Fire Chief Chuck Sanchez is en route. I was thinking, my god, 747, where is it at? Is it on island? Is it on sea? Uh, what is the plan here? fell off the side of the container and the Asian gentleman disappeared into the jungle. So I rolled over onto my back and I managed to crawl with my elbows. There was still a bit of skin on my elbows left. Small has a badly broken right leg. He crawls away from the wreckage. Many more people remain trapped inside. Lying there, it just sounded like a battlefield. It was just like a movie. 
Things were exploding short of me, going over the top of me. Things were landing beside us on fire. It's just indescribable. There's only one way for emergency crews to get down to the wreck site, along a single access road that runs beside Nimitz Hill. As they race to the accident scene, rescue workers discover a major obstacle. A pipeline has been ripped out of the ground by the crash and thrown across the road. There's no way around it. Having heard about the crash, the island's governor, Carl Guterres, has joined the rescue team. Engine Company 7, get this thing out of the way. You guys, get the medic kits and come with me. We reached the closest point of approach to the crash site, which was up the hill, and probably about another 150 yards downhill. I, your gentlemen, uh, turn on whatever lights you got to uh, guide us down this path, and uh, let's let's do it. We started running and just listening to the screams, so we can guide ourselves, uh, because there was just nothing but overgrowth on the side of the road. Uh, at one point, I stopped him. I go, Governor, um, sir, I need you to make some serious decision in this operation, and I don't think I want you to move further. Uh, I'd like for you to stay on this side, and uh, you know, I don't want you to get hurt. You know, let us do this job. And he goes, No, I want to help you guys. At the sight of the crash, flames are devouring the wreckage. <laughs> Hampered by his broken leg, Small can only look on as people cry out for help. I lay at that bank for the whole night during that time, hearing people call out in a foreign language, which initially sounded like good, healthy calls for help, then turned into screams as the fire got more intense. And after a period of time, the fire even grew worse and the screams faded away. Finally, almost an hour after the accident, Sanchez's crew reaches the site. I split them up into two rescue and search units. I need half of you guys to start from the tail end and I need the other half to start from the front end of this plane. And let's meet in the middle and uh, you know, let's do what we can to help the survivors here. Guam's governor, Carl Guterres, sees Rika Matsuda all alone and crying out for her mother. I'm crying, little angel. Everything will be OK. I did not dare let her go. It's something that I almost like there was a bond between me and that young that little girl. And I found out later she was 11, but she looked really smaller than 11 years old. Fire Chief Chuck Sanchez finds Barry Small in the sword grass. <laughs> he gave me his fire jacket and put it under my head to comfort me. Here I go. All right, let's go. Later on, he was very distressed that he had to come back and get it back because he was getting burnt, dragging people and bodies out of the aircraft. We were cutting trees to use for splint. Uh, we were taking off our uh, protective gears to uh, cover the survivors. It's clear to rescue personnel that for many, they've arrived too late. But Sanchez isn't giving up. He sends a team to search further into the wreckage. Group two, start at the tail and work forward. Go. Well, I heard it was this large explosion, man, right where they were at.
Spinego. Did we lose our people? A Boeing 747 has crashed on a rugged hillside in Guam, just a few miles short of the airport. There were 254 people on board. Rescue workers comb through the wreckage when an explosion rips through the remains of the plane. Low radio transmission at all, we lost all transmission. And uh, then finally, somebody came out. Um, Sir, we're OK. Uh, we survived the explosion. Uh, everybody's accounted for. It's not until the dawn finally comes that rescue workers can see the extent of the damage. The plane has spilled down the mountain and broken into several large pieces. Only 26 people survived the disaster. Friends and family are desperate for any news. Many bodies are badly burned. Although most of the passengers are Korean, Sean Burke and his girlfriend Wendy Bunton are among a few Americans on the flight. Thousands of kilometers away, news of the crash reaches Sean's parents. When she hears about the crash, Sean Burke's stepmother doesn't know if Sean is alive or dead. He could have been uh, burned in the crash. He could be unconscious in a local hospital there. And we just wanted to go over and bring him back. So, I mean, because that kept going through our mind that He possibly could be laying on the hillside. Since Guam is an American territory, the responsibility for investigating the crash falls to the National Transportation Safety Board. Greg Fife is the lead investigator. When he arrives on the site, he has to contend with more than just the carnage of the plane crash. Grieving family members surround the scene, making it especially difficult for investigators to work. As an accident investigator, you have to keep your emotions in check. It's like being a doctor in an ER room. You, have, you, you see this devastation, you see this tragedy unfolding in front of you. You hear about all of the, the sad stories, especially when there are kids and, and innocent people involved. And as an accident investigator, you have to keep those emotions in check because you have to remain objective, you have to remain emotionless to be able to do your job effectively. And we had a whole building full of people just like us. They were all grieving and crying out. It was just horrible. One of the first things we did was we went out on site and we did a, what we call a site survey. We had to really get an understanding of what we were dealing with as far as the wreckage and how we were going to conduct the on-scene investigation. During the preliminary investigation, Fife finds that large sections of the plane are almost completely intact. The airplane landed relatively under control. That is that the pilot basically landed the airplane into the trees and into that terrain. Unfortunately, it was three miles from the airport. Investigators find a number of items that survived the crash and the fire that followed, including the landing chart the crew was using as it approached Guam Airport. Investigators also find Captain Park's travel bag, and in it discover a small plastic pill container. Captain Park had been prescribed a variety of drugs, 
including pills containing benzodiazepine, a class of drugs often used as a sedative. The pills and tissue samples from Captain Park's remains are sent for analysis. The landing chart becomes part of a growing pile of evidence. Using information from the jet's flight data recorder, investigators recreate the plane's flight path. The relatively gentle slope of its descent supports Fyth's belief that the jet all but landed on the hillside. But the flight path shouldn't look like this. Korean Air 801 cleared for ILS, runway 6, left approach. Glide slope unusable. Korean 801, roger, clear for ILS, runway 6, left. The crew had been told that the glide slope at the airport wasn't working. It meant that the captain had to take more manual control of his plane. It is now up to the pilot to fly an established procedure called a step down, where he starts at an altitude of, say, 2,000 feet. He, when, when he gets to a particular point located by what they call DME, or distance measuring equipment, he then starts a descent to another prescribed altitude. If the crew was following the step-down procedure, its flight path would resemble a set of stairs. But after the first step, the plane enters a long, slow descent. If you don't hit those step downs and those altitudes are prescribed to give you terrain clearance, if you don't fly that as depicted on the approach chart, you run the risk of flying into an obstruction or high terrain. The plane's cockpit voice recorder has also been recovered from the debris. Fife and his team begin to analyze it, hoping to better understand what happened in the cockpit. Set. 562. On two separate occasions, Captain Park gave orders to descend long before he was supposed to. But there are other clues on the tape as well. The cockpit voice recorder provided us, the investigators, quite a bit of information. But one of the key elements that we found was that the flight crew appeared to be tired. Really sleepy. And this was a chartered flight, so it would have put them on what we call backside of the clock flying. That is, they wouldn't be normally flying during the day, they are now flying at night. And typically your body says you should be asleep when it's dark outside. The sedatives could have made a difficult situation even worse. But when the lab results come back, they're conclusive. While he had the pills with him, there are no traces of them in Captain Park's system. When lead investigator Greg Fyth returns to the cockpit voice recorder, he focuses on the captain's discussion of the glide slope. Is the glide slope working? The glide slope, yeah? Yes. Yes, it's working. Why is it working? He started to see the glide slope needle move a little bit and started to question the other crew members as to whether or not the glide slope was actually working or not. It's early in the morning. After a long flight, Captain Park is tired, perhaps confused and distracted by the unexpected readings on his glide slope. It became very apparent listening to the cockpit voice recorder that in fact he got fixated but Fyth still doesn't understand why Park's glide slope appeared to be working. Was there a problem on this plane? Or is the equipment susceptible to problems that could affect other jets as well? To find out, he brings in navigation expert Nelson Spornheimer. I spent some time looking at the transcript, uh, trying to determine what the navigation issues were, why the, a good airplane was in the wrong place and to investigate the apparent confusion on the part of the crew who thought that the glide slope was working at least part of the time. Spornheimer sends a team of investigators to Guam. They fly over the island, trying to determine whether radio signals from a nearby military base could have acted on the plane, making it seem like the glide slope was working. Glide slope receivers can respond to non-glide slope signals, particularly when the intended glide slope signal is absent. If, if there are spurious signals on the channel and they contain the right information, they can cause intermittent movements of the glide slope needle. Set 560 feet. 
but the signals wouldn't be sustained. Like a light switch turning quickly on and off, the glide slope indicator would give periodic indications that it was working, but not for long. My conclusion was that spurious signals, whether they be from other transmitters or failed ground equipment, such as personal walkie-talkies, could not cause a sustained warning flag movement. If the glide slope wasn't fully operating, why did Park believe it was? And even if he did believe it was working, why did he crash into Nimitz Hill? Isn't the glide slope working? Wiper on. As investigators continue to try to piece together the causes of the crash, Barry Small is trying to understand why he and 25 others survived. I went to touch my shoes, we hit the ground, and I was accidentally in the perfect crash position by some, some sort of miracle. An airline engineering apprentice and helicopter pilot, Small understands airplanes. I do firmly believe there are some changes that could be made to aircraft. Small believes that the way crossbars are built into aircraft seats caused one of his legs to break, but luck saved his other leg. My right leg went forward and crashed into the bar in front of the seat and broke. And my left leg was saved by my carry bag, stopping my leg going forward and hit that bar. Still able to walk on his one good leg, Small escapes while others remain trapped inside. Since she's young, Rika Matsuda's legs are shorter than a normal adult. Sitting normally, her legs wouldn't have been pressed against the crossbar on impact, so she was able to escape the plane. Oh, oh, now. Get out of here. While her mother died. Small is also convinced that the flames that first spread through the cabin of Korean Air Flight 801 were preventable. They estimate that those top lockers had over 462 litres of burnable alcohol on board. Had the plane been full, it could be at least twice that amount. During the crash, Small believes that the duty-free alcohol mixed with oxygen in the plane's ceiling. The combination ignited with deadly results. It's a fire he thinks could have been prevented. Why have this risk, alcohol and oxygen? I thought, you know, for aircraft's about safety, and this is a, just a blatant breaking of the rules of safety as far as I'm concerned. As he continues to recover from the accident, Small is determined to prevent what had happened to him from happening to others. He decides to push for changes on how seats are made and how duty-free alcohol is stored. For NTSB investigator Greg Fyth, the biggest question still remains. How did an experienced pilot, one recently honored by his company for his safety record, crash his plane five kilometers short of the airport? As the investigation continues, he discovers that the landing chart the crew was using was more than six months old and out of date. It's an indication that the crew could have been better prepared for the landing. When he reviews the training practices for Korean Airlines, Fife uncovers more gaps in the information that the crew received. We found that the Korean Airlines flight crew had all of their training based on airports with approaches where the DME was always co-located at the airport. DME is distance measuring equipment, electronic beacons that tell pilots where they are in relation to the airport. Often the final beacon is found at the foot of the runway. That was not the case in Guam. The airport was in fact five kilometers further on. Struggling to see through the rain, Park was unable to find the airport. Distracted by the unexpected glide slope readings, Park used the final beacon as a guide, 
expecting it to take him right to the runway. Let's make a missed approach. Not inside. That looks like missed approach. Go around. Go around. Flaps. It's clear that Flight A01 flew an approach about three miles premature. In other words, the descent was about three miles early. It was a nominal approach otherwise, just to the wrong location. We think that based on fatigue and um, some of their training, that in fact, when the flight crew crashed the airplane, when the counter got to zero, they thought the airport should be there. A fully loaded 747 weighs more than 200,000 kilograms. Like an enormous ocean liner, it can't change course quickly. Blinded by rain and relying on their equipment, the crew of Korean Air Flight 801 thought they were heading straight at the runway. When they realized something was wrong, it was too late. As the investigation continues, Fife and his team make a startling discovery. Equipment that would have given the crew more time to react had been disabled on purpose. In August of 1997, the crash of Korean Air Flight 801 took the lives of more than 200 people. The final accident investigation report is published more than two years after the crash. It lays blame on the Korean Airlines training methods and the crew's over-reliance on the jet's automation. But it also has sharp words reserved for the FAA, the body that regulates air travel in the United States. Because of an FAA decision, a critical piece of technology that could have saved Flight 801 was intentionally disabled. The Minimum Safe Altitude Warning System, or MSOAR, is a standard piece of equipment at major American airports. But in Guam, the FAA had made a critical alteration to the way it was used. MSOAR uses radar to watch the planes as they come into the airport. If they're too low, a warning is given to air traffic controllers, who can then relay it to the crew. But in Guam, the system kept giving nuisance readings to controllers. The controllers kept getting these nuisance warnings. They redesigned the software and moved the limitations of the MSAW further away from the airport, where it afforded no one a level of protection. Instead of watching the planes as they neared the airport, the system in Guam now tracked them when they were more than 80 kilometers away, over the ocean. I think the best way to describe that would have been and should be irresponsible because you've taken this system that was designed as a level of protection, not only for the controller, but you've taken the protection away from the flying public. For the passengers and crew of Flight 801, the lack of the MSOR system sealed their fate. If the system had been working, the crash could have been avoided. Without it, the crew had no warning at all. The two pilots didn't want to die. They had families. No one wanted to die. Um, we still do not blame them. It's, the bottom line is nobody wanted to be in that situation. It was just something that happened. For Barry Small, the years since the crash of Flight 801 have been emotional and frustrating. The Civil Aviation Authority in his homeland of New Zealand has acknowledged the potential danger posed by duty-free liquor on board. But so far, no policies have been changed. His desire to modify airplane seat design has also been ignored. I have taken several steps to um, put this idea forward and in a lot of cases, it's initially met, it, met with enthusiasm, but it eventually ends up in the too hard basket. And 
When I try to approach seat design people, there's no one wants to hear about it. Sean Burke was never officially identified as a victim of Flight 801. Wendy Bunton was positively identified, but DNA samples only proved that a white male was on the plane near her. Bill and I never gave up hope um, that Sean had survived the crash. Um, even after we came home for, I would say, a year or two, every time the phone rang, every time somebody knocked on the door, um, we expected a phone message saying, hi, Dad, this is your son, Sean. Eventually, several years after the crash, Barry Small was able to give Kathy Burke and her husband some sense of finality and an enduring image of their son. When we met him and he wanted to tell us that in the 12 hour layover in Seoul, he was wandering around and finally heard two people speaking English. And he said they were so much in love that he did not want to interrupt their conversation. For Sean's father, the deep sorrow of the crash will never completely leave. For me, the grief of Sean's loss never ends. Hasn't gotten better, hasn't gotten worse. Just another day. Uh, for everybody else, it's gone. You know, I expect people to move on, but I'll be the, this way till the day I'm, I'm with him again. For Barry Small, there is anger too, but also incredible gratitude for surviving. So many people have told me that I survived for a reason. I've been searching for that reason for nine years now. And I truly believe if someone would listen to my story about the oxygen and alcohol and the improvement of the seats, that I could justify in my own mind that I don't have to feel guilty about surviving. The sands of Egypt hide thousands of years of history. Monuments to ancient civilizations dominate the landscape. But for sun-loving Europeans, Egypt is also a resort destination, where the most important sand is on the beach. The town of Sharm el-Sheikh is several hundred kilometers southeast of Cairo. Perched on the Red Sea, it's a natural destination for people looking for a little rest and relaxation. Sharm el-Sheikh is quite popular with Europeans. The reason is, where can you get very warm sea with a five-hour flight? And you have the Red Sea, which is crystal clear, beautiful mountains. It's just extraordinary. The city's popularity is growing. More than four million people a year use Sharm El Sheikh's airport. In the early days of 2004, tourists aren't the only ones drawn to the local beaches. British Prime Minister Tony Blair is also in the region visiting Egyptian leader Hosni Mubarak. Just after two in the morning on January the 3rd, many vacationers are still out on the town. But 53-year-old Captain Kader Abdullah is just starting his day. He's renowned for his punctuality. 
A former officer in the Egyptian Air Force, Kader is now a highly respected captain with the charter company Flash Airlines. He always liked to pack his own suitcase. He wouldn't let me do it for him. He always said, I would like to prepare my own things to make sure I don't forget anything. He was very precise on what he wanted and what he would take with him. Captain Kader meets up with his 25-year-old first officer, Amar El Shafi. Together, they'll fly out of Sharm El Sheikh, heading for Paris. Good morning. Good morning, sir. El Shafi is young enough to be the captain's son. The early morning flight isn't for everyone. Pascal Mercier and his family are supposed to be on the flash jet, but changed their plans. I was booked on the Flash Island flight. When my agency told me that I had to wake up very early and then we had to change planes in Cairo, I said, this is really stupid. I mean, if my daughter was like two years old and the other ones were like six and eight. So really, I didn't feel comfortable about changing planes and so on. For other tourists, the cheap tickets that Flash offers are worth the trouble of getting up early. France Toulier was able to bring his entire family to Egypt. They need the break. My brother-in-law had just lost his father, so he brought his children, his mother and his wife there just to have a good time. Not to see the sights or anything, just to have a good time. That's what Sharm El Sheikh is known for. Fatima Hijaji is also heading back to Paris after a vacation in Sharm. The mother of five is flying alone. Before takeoff, she calls her nephew in France. I was asleep when she called. I didn't really want to get into a conversation with her. She was someone who called you for everything. She needed to be reassured. So, even though she had the five or six hour flight ahead of her, she just wanted to make sure that I would be there to pick her up at the airport. In all, 148 passengers and crew settle into their seats aboard the jet. It's 5 a.m. In the cockpit, Ashraf Abdel Hamid is the third member of the crew. He's training as a first officer, although he's worked for years piloting corporate jets. None of the crew members are happy with the poor quality of the weather information they're getting from the local air traffic controller. They didn't say sky clear, they said clouds and sky clear. How? The two are opposite. Ask them about ceiling. No ceiling and clouds and sky clear. Maybe it's scattered. Maybe he means scatter. Good morning. Good morning. The captain is also frustrated that one of his instruments isn't working. Although the engineer agrees there's a problem, it's not serious enough to fix. The men laugh it off at the expense of the first officer. Probably called by Ma. Making a heavy landing. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Captain Kader and his entire crew, we welcome you on board Flash Airlines Boeing 737-300. It's still hours before dawn when the plane lifts off. The Flash Airlines flight will head out over the Red Sea before turning towards Cairo. The jet climbs through a pitch black night. Without a moon to light the scene, it's hard for the passengers to see much of anything outside their windows. 
In the cockpit, the simple turn over the Red Sea is taking a bizarre twist. See what the aircraft just did? Captain Kado doesn't like the way his plane is behaving. Turning right, sir. What? Aircraft is turning right. Turning right? How turning right? The plane is supposed to be turning left on its way to Cairo. Instead, it's turning in the opposite direction. Okay. Well. The captain tries to get his plane back on course, but his situation just gets worse. Knowing he's in trouble, the captain tells the first officer to engage the autopilot. Autopilot! Autopilot! But it doesn't work. No autopilot, Commander! The 737 is now flying almost completely on its side. The plane gains speed as it spirals towards the Red Sea. Just minutes after takeoff, the plane is out of control. Diving towards the water, it's traveling at more than 700 kilometers an hour. Everyone on board is running out of time. Just minutes after takeoff, an early morning flight has become a desperate battle for survival. A passenger jet filled with French families is plunging towards the Red Sea. Everyone on board can feel the tremendous speed and gut-wrenching turns. The enormous G-forces are making it difficult for Captain Kedar Abdullah to fly the plane. Ashraf Abdel Hamid, the third member of the flight crew, tells the captain to slow the plane down. Retard power! Retard power! Retard power! The plane is traveling so fast it's threatening to tear itself apart. After flying almost upside down, the crew is finally beginning to bring their plane under control. Then they hear the ground proximity warning. They're getting dangerously close to the Red Sea. <laughs> Pascal Mercier and his family are staying at a beachfront hotel. My daughter woke up suddenly screaming like hell, screaming like if something happened. I didn't hear the crash, but maybe she did. It's okay. <laughs> it's just before five in the morning, minutes after the plane took off from the airport. It's disappeared from local radar screens. By the time the sun rises, the crash site is found, but there's little for rescuers to do. The plane shattered on impact. A postcard is found saying simply, I think this card will arrive after me. Pieces of debris litter the surface, but most of the plane has sunk beneath the waves. There are no survivors. All 148 people on board the plane are dead. Flight 604 was to land at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris in the morning. As family and friends wait, officials list the plane as delayed and then slowly break the news of the accident. They asked me, are you waiting for someone from Sharm el-Sheikh? You say, yes. 
Then they say, could you come with us? We are going to take you to a hotel. At the hotel, we'll explain it all to you. It was very strange since we were greeted in an hotel and we passed people who were leaving happy because they were looking for the same information as us, but their families were not on the list. They came with a paper in hand. Here, yes, Madame Hijaji, Fatima. We apologize that you have to learn it this way, but she's dead. Later, on his voicemail, Mohammed Hijaji hears Fatima's message sent during the flight. I heard a scream, a noise. After that, I didn't hear anything. Captain Kader's wife hears about the crash from her son. My son called me from abroad and told me that he had heard there was an accident in Flash Airlines. I was in disbelief for a while until it became reality. It was a very big shock for me. In resort hotels, workers check the empty rooms of those who were on Flight 604. But one of the rooms is occupied. Mr. Mercy. This guy from the hotel, the, the hotel staff, began to cry. He was really shocked, happily shocked to see us. He thought we were in the flight with everybody else. <laughs> they're, they're here. In my hotel, 82 people were on that flight. 82 people. It was a really, really strange. Really, really heavy. But we were really lucky. There had been no mayday call from the plane. No warning to air traffic control that something was wrong. With the plane crashing just minutes after it left the airport, there are immediate concerns that a bomb had brought the jet down. The plane had just taken off, and it looked very strange why this accident happened so quickly after takeoff. When investigators examined the plane's flight path, they discover it would have gone directly over the town where Egyptian leader Hosni Mubarak kept a vacation home. It's also close to the house where British Prime Minister Tony Blair and his family were staying. Blair and his family were supposed to leave from the same airport that day. Security around the Prime Minister is immediately heightened. Two days after the crash, authorities receive a phone call. Terrorists from Yemen claim responsibility for the crash. They say it's a protest against a French law banning the Muslim headscarf, the hijab, in public schools. But in spite of the phone call and the rumors swirling around Egypt, investigators quickly rule out terrorism. If you have a wreckage distributed of a very large area, that means the plane was disintegrating in the air and due to an explosion, it would be disintegrating on a wide area. In this case, there was very, very few pieces and all located in a very small area. So this indicated that the plane was intact and went into the water intact. If it wasn't terrorism, what had ripped the plane from the sky so quickly? Investigators face an enormous challenge. The plane has sunk below the surface of the Red Sea. Divers have to fight off sharks that are drawn to the carnage. The rescue teams find few bodies intact. The aircraft and most of the 148 passengers and crew have sunk over 1,000 meters to the bottom of the Red Sea. 
The first task of investigators is to find the aircraft's flight data and cockpit voice recorders, the black boxes. If they survive the crash, they will now be on the seabed. But this part of the Red Sea has never been charted. With so many French tourists involved, the French government offers to help in any way it can. The French immediately responded by sending a boat specially equipped with robots to uh, search the bottom of the, uh, of the sea. But the wreckage is too deep. The sub that the French boat has can't survive the enormous pressure at the bottom of the sea. The investigators desperately need another submarine. But they're running out of time. The black box transmits a radio signal, but the battery only lasts for 30 days. If investigators can't find it within a month, the mystery of Flight 604 may never be solved. Getting to the black boxes before the time the pingers stopped transmitting was always a very worrisome aspect to all the investigation team. Everybody was working uh, 24 hours around the clock to try to salvage these and try to locate them first. While the recovery effort continues, family and friends of the victims begin to mourn those who died. They pressure investigators to solve the mystery. It's the biggest air disaster involving French nationals, the biggest in the history of civil aviation. American, French, and Egyptian experts join forces. While waiting for the plane's black boxes to be recovered, they also begin focusing on Flash Airlines itself. Flying just two planes, it was one of a number of low-cost charter companies that had been competing for customers in Europe. In the last 10 years, there had been a rapid expansion of budget airlines throughout this part of the world. Offering inexpensive, no-frills service, they fought for a piece of the holiday market. Seaside resorts like Sharm El Sheikh were one of the many destinations they serve. Now, one of the ways in which they provide this extremely cheap travel is by operating their aeroplanes 24 hours a day. Operating on such tight schedules means the planes are flown constantly. Former Flash passengers step forward to complain about other flights. There are a lot of stories. I was flying home after a vacation. A year before the crash, while flying from Sharm El Sheikh to Bologna, one passenger recalls seeing flames pouring from a Flash Airlines jet. Hey, hey, the engine's on fire. Look. Please. The flaming aircraft is forced to make an emergency landing. Investigators learned that in 2002, the Swiss Aviation Authority performed a surprise inspection on the same plane that would later crash. The pilot's oxygen masks are missing. There aren't enough oxygen tanks. Some of the cockpit instruments aren't working. It's enough for the Swiss to ground the flight for eight hours until the company repairs the plane. A few days later, Flash Airlines was banned from flying in Switzerland. Another ban occurred in Poland. In Norway, tour operators stopped contracting with Flash. It's a rare event for an airline to be banned from operating into a country. They had to have done something dramatically wrong, especially when it comes to safety. With mounting concerns about the safety record of Flash Airlines, investigators comb through the company's paperwork they discover that the most recent maintenance records for the plane that crashed were never duplicated. They've gone missing with the aircraft. The lack of having copies of the technical log and all of them being on board, of course, this is a violation. And the civil aviation here issued 
uh, very uh, clear uh, instructions that this should not happen. The French authorities agree that there are serious questions about Flash. They now ban the company from flying in France. While there are concerns about the state of the company's planes, there are no such issues when it comes to the crew of Flight 604. Captain Kader was considered not only a flying ace, but a national war hero for his performance in the Yom Kippur War. During his career, he not only flew sophisticated fighter jets, but also a variety of large cargo aircraft. He had over 7,000 hours of flying experience, as well as 2,000 hours as a flight instructor. All the evidence shows that Captain Kader was a model pilot. With the aircraft and its black box data recorders still hidden deep under the Red Sea, investigators wonder, was this a case of a superb pilot fighting to save a decrepit plane? See what the aircraft did? On a moonless January night, a Flash Airline 737 spiraled wildly into the Red Sea. All 148 people on board were killed. Investigators trying to find out why the plane went down have uncovered a history of safety problems with the airline. But trying to prove that there was anything wrong with the plane that crashed is difficult. Much of the wreckage has sunk deep beneath the waves. Investigators have been unable to find the flight's black boxes. Whenever an airplane crashes into the water, there's always a fear by investigators that the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder may not be recovered. Those two boxes in and of themselves give the investigator a very good picture and without them could make the investigation process very, very difficult. Finally, after several days of searching, a breakthrough. A French research ship hears the locator signals given off by the black boxes. A remotely operated sub drops down over 1,000 meters. The violence of the crash has spread the wreckage over a wide area. Two weeks after the crash, both the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder are recovered from the bottom of the sea. Investigators finally have some hard evidence. The Egyptian, French, and American team examines the critical devices in Cairo. After the two black boxes are found, the salvage effort wraps up. Other than a select number of small pieces, the rest of the plane is too deep to recover. The cost to continue would be too great. Without the wreckage itself, investigators concentrate on what they do have. They hope the black boxes will recreate the final minutes of the doomed plane. One of the things we did to depict the path of the aircraft was we created an animation based on the data we got from the flight data recorder and from radar. The flight data recorder paints a devastating picture. Shortly after takeoff, the plane began heading left, just as it was supposed to. But then it quickly started banking in the other direction. The cockpit voice recorder shows that the turn caught the captain off guard. Turning right, sir. What? How turning right? Analyzing the cockpit voice recorder, it showed that the pilots were experiencing definitely some kind of an abnormality, a problem that they could not understand. The investigators sift through the flight data to find some explanation for the jet's bizarre movement. Perhaps some mechanical fault was forcing the plane off course. 
and there is an indication that something was wrong with the flash jet before it took off. On the runway, the captain and the ground engineer discussed an electrical malfunction. But it's impossible to tell from the cockpit voice recorder exactly what the problem was. Especially electrical. We can't be sure which equipment was being referred to by the aircraft captain and the engineer when they were discussing faulty equipment. Not enough parts were brought up from the bottom of the sea to be able to determine that. And tragically, the ground engineer was also on the flight. We believe from the data we, we are looking at in the flight data recorder that there is a very high possibility that the plane was tending to turn to the right by itself. But what exactly had gone wrong? A thorough accident investigation can take years. But in the case of Flash Flight 604, there are unique challenges. The problem with accident investigation is that it's very time consuming and resource intensive, especially when we don't have an airplane to physically look at. You want to be absolutely sure of the facts, conditions, and circumstances before you publish that information. Family and friends of the victims are becoming more and more frustrated. As the months pass, they demand answers. We were led to protest outside the Egyptian embassy because we had no news. Eleven months after the disaster, we had no message, no information. Shortly after the protest, Egyptian investigators release a factual report. It contains all of the information from the black boxes, but the report does not reach any conclusions about why the jet crashed. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. With a situation as complicated as this one, the investigators don't yet have any answers. The only thing they can do is to keep looking. Investigators discuss several possible scenarios that could have been responsible for the plane's erratic course. You look into every hypothetical scenario that would create a similar profile. And then you see if this profile fit the data that you have put together. 50 different theories are examined in minute detail. In the process of looking into all the possible hypothetical scenarios, we proceeded by eliminating those that did not fit the data. Investigators travel to the United States to test the most likely ideas in a sophisticated simulator. If they can force the simulator to repeat the movements of the flash jet, they might be able to figure out why the plane crashed. The results are brought back to Cairo. There are only four mechanical faults that could have produced the flight path of the doomed jet. Investigators believe the key to the crash is to find out why the plane began turning off course. These four scenarios were all related to what would cause an uncommanded bank. So we were left with these as causes that we could not rule out. Two of the scenarios involved the spoilers on the plane's right wing. Spoilers lift up from the top surface of the wing, slowing it down. By producing drag or spoiling the airflow, they help turn the aircraft. If the pilot's control wheel or the cables that connect it to the spoiler jammed, it could have forced the plane off course. Problems with the spoilers are one explanation, but there's no physical proof. And while there were maintenance problems with flash planes, none of them had to do with the jet spoilers. 
The team searches for another explanation. Another potential cause of the crash is the plane's ailerons. This part of a plane's wing controls the angle of a plane's turn. A malfunctioning aileron could have caused the plane to roll to the right. Again, if the crew couldn't fix the problem, the plane would have begun to spiral into the sea. While so-called aileron trim runaway would create a flight path like the one seen during the crash, once again, there's no physical proof to support the theory. And typically, aileron trim runaway can be physically overcome by pilots. All he would have had to do was overpower using more force to move the control wheel in an opposite direction. Overbanked. When they listen to the cockpit voice recorder, the investigators are puzzled by the constant discussion of the plane's autopilot. Autopilot. The captain asked for the autopilot to be turned on. But it had no effect, and the plane began to plummet to the sea. And earlier in the cockpit recording, investigators uncover another curious exchange. Captain Cader began the initial turn over the Red Sea manually, but decided to let the autopilot take over. Autopilot. The flight data recorder shows that the autopilot was indeed turned on as the plane climbed. Not yet. But then the captain appears to change his mind. The plane's flight data recorder shows that the autopilot was only activated for three seconds. But investigators wonder if the autopilot had malfunctioned and stayed in command of the jet. The automated system could have continued to control the plane, flying it to the right, even after the pilots thought it had been disengaged. The malfunction of the autopilot, of course, took a lot of work from us because it was nearly impossible to show that it did not happen and quite impossible to show that it did happen. So, but it was always a very prominent possibility because it would give a very, very close scenario to what was happening. Perhaps most puzzling of all, though, is that no matter what happened to the plane, it appeared to be under control just before it crashed. Moments before impact, the captain was seemingly back in command of his airplane. If there had been some crippling mechanical problem, why did it seem to disappear? Some members of the team want to consider something besides mechanical fault. The pilots themselves. I think the major concern for the United States was that the human factors elements of this accident weren't thoroughly explored. Perhaps the high esteem given to Egyptian pilots was getting in the way. In Egypt, pilots are very respected. And in particular, Air Force pilots are very highly regarded. For the past 26 years, the country's president has been a highly decorated Air Force officer. In an environment like this, the pilot is somewhat immune to suspicion. When something goes wrong, the natural tendency is to blame the equipment. And on this flight, the pilot was a war hero with thousands of hours of experience. Studying the flight data recorders again, the investigators discover something peculiar. Even before the plane's bizarre turn to the right, three things all seem to happen at the same time. Instead of a smooth left turn, the plane begins to come out of its turn early. The nose starts to rise, and the plane's airspeed decreases noticeably. But during this time, the pilot says nothing. It seems that he's unaware of the changes to his flight path. I've flown out of Sharm at night time and in the same type of aircraft. And in no way should the pilot allow the airspeed to drop by as much as 30 knots, or the bank angle to change beyond five degrees without clearly stating the reasons for the change in the flight path. Some investigators consider a provocative theory. 
that might explain this seemingly bizarre behavior. Perhaps Captain Kader had been affected by vertigo. Vertigo is a physiological condition that would exist with any person, not just pilots. And it's based on the inner ear, over a dark ocean, without a defined visual horizon, no ground lights. The pilot may not be able to perceive visually whether he was flying up, down, left, or right. And if the fluid in his inner ear was moving or he tilted his head, that may induce a sensation, a physiological sensation, that may cause the pilot to believe the airplane is flying straight and level when it's actually turning. The plane's flight path is ideal for creating a sense of vertigo. The flash airline jet took off into a moonless night. Captain Kader was flying manually and began to turn as he was climbing. Heading out over dark water, it would be very difficult using just his senses for Captain Kader to know exactly where he was. Roger, when ready, inshallah. Left turn to establish 306, Sharm VOR. It is actually a very high workload situation. And when there are no visual cues outside because it's a moonless night and you're over featureless territory with no lights in it, you really, as a professional pilot, should be totally aware of the fact that this is a situation in which you could get disorientated. It's a classic. It's happened so many times. It's killed so many people in the last 10 years. When the plane was supposed to be turning slowly left, the control wheel began inching towards the right. Perhaps the captain was making the turn without even being aware of it. When you study the movement of the aircraft control surfaces, it appears that something was guiding Captain Cutter to the right. Now, that could have been a false horizon or something he's seen outside of his window. See what the aircraft just did? Or perhaps he believed he was actually correcting a problem with the plane itself. He thinks he's gained his flight path again. And all of a sudden, at this moment, he receives contradictory information. Turning right, sir. What? Aircraft is turning right. The contradictory information adds to the pilot's confusion. He believes he's fixing a problem when he's told his problems have just started. In this particular instance, not only are you trying to fly the airplane and understand situationally what's happening, but you're going through the mental gymnastics because your expectations are one way. Meanwhile, you have the first officer who's telling him something that's totally different. Aircraft is turning right. Egyptian investigators agree that Captain Kader may have suffered some form of disorientation during the flight. But they don't believe it was the only problem the crew was dealing with. I don't really have a very clear indication that there was disorientation, but it's possible. There was a recovery from disorientation. The time to find out the problem and take the corrective action needed was more than the time left before impact. No matter what role disorientation played in the crash, investigators are about to learn that the crew wasn't properly trained to deal with it. Flash Airlines never provided the pilots with basic information that could have saved their lives. It's been two years since an Egyptian charter plane smashed into the Red Sea. 148 people were killed. Investigators trying to figure out why Flash Airlines Flight 604 crashed face immense challenges. Most of the wreck is still deep underwater. By carefully examining the plane's black boxes, the investigators believe that disorientation may have played a role in the accident. The pitch black night and the featureless sea caused the pilot to become confused about what was happening. But mechanical problems may also have plagued the plane. As they continue to try to solve the mystery, investigators make a startling discovery. 
Officials at Flash Airlines revealed that they hadn't provided the pilots with crew resource management training, although it was a requirement for the company. It might have helped the crew deal with their horrifying situation. Crew resource management is a program where pilots are trained to work together rather than as individuals. Had the pilots of Flash Air 604 received a formal CRM training program, the outcome of this flight may have been substantially different. American investigators believe the very junior first officer may have felt the plane was in trouble before the captain did, but failed to offer suggestions to his much more experienced co-worker. Right. Nor did he attempt to take control of the plane. Right. Formal CRM training would have empowered the first officer who had the best situational awareness and the most information about the position of the airplane to take command of the airplane when he saw that the captain wasn't taking the appropriate corrective action. An earlier conversation in the cockpit before takeoff may reveal why the young first officer would have been reluctant to challenge the captain. Yesterday. We were coming in at dusk, and the sun was 2-2. But I, I felt I could hardly see the runway. He's already saying, in sight. <laughs> what in sight? Aid, sir. It may not have meant to be insulting, but it may have reinforced the first officer's feeling that he was the student and the captain was the teacher. <laughs> I am unable to raise my eyes, and he says, in sight. <laughs> Where in sight? <laughs> it is going to serve as negative feedback. The young first officer is bound to hesitate. He doesn't want to be wrong again. He doesn't want to lose the respect of an Air Force general. In a crew, an effort must be made to bring together people who are able to co-pilot, not a crew in which one person pilots and the other person looks on without saying a word. But the captain and the co-pilot weren't alone in the cockpit. A third crew member with more experience than the first officer was also there. Maybe he was scattered. He too never said anything until the final seconds of the flight. Otherwise, how will we know when we clear the cloud? We hear him speak very clearly and very openly all during the time before the engine startup. He was in conversation with the first officer and with the captain. So this experienced person being very quiet all through, we believe that he, if he saw any of the crew members doing something that he should not be doing, or uh, not doing something that he should be doing, would have said something. Retard power, retard power! The only word he said was, retard the throttles at the later stage of the event. Shows that the, that's, that's the only thing he saw that should be done. Even if the co-pilot had taken control sooner, there's no way to know if he could have saved the jet. Whatever took place on Flight 604 happened quickly. And since the plane had just taken off, the crew had little time to react before they crashed into the sea. The final report on the Flash Airlines crash was released in March 2006. There are no clear answers. Egyptian officials say that any of four mechanical problems could have caused the crash. They say disorientation may have played a role, but it's not the reason behind the accident. American investigators refuse to blame the plane. Instead, they say the problem lies with the airline, which didn't sufficiently train their crews. The pilots are responding based on skills, abilities, knowledge, and what they got out of training. If the training was deficient, that's a company responsibility. Two months after the crash, Flash Airlines went out of business. And as a result of the Flash 604 tragedy, new rules came into place to ensure that in the future, aircraft safety violations will be judged more harshly. The Flash Airlines crash gave the final political impetus to a move to create a European blacklist where if one state banned an airline, then all the other 
Euro Euro European Union states would automatically ban that airline also. The Egyptian investigation concluded with an important recommendation. We have recommended that some kind of training or uh, awareness program should be made to be able to have a pilot observe another being disoriented early and what he should do to first maintain a safe flight, second to pull the, pull the pilot from his disorientation back to orientation. Was there a mechanical problem at the heart of the crash? Investigators will likely never know. With so much of the plane still at the bottom of the Red Sea, questions will always remain for investigators and everyone else who was affected by the crash. I lost my nephews and my niece. They were just kids. What future would they have had? How can you put a price on that? What a waste. The families will never be able to fully mourn, me included, because we'll never know what's really happened.